If there's one institution in this country which has uh, been largely a political, largely incorruptible, and which has delivered each time that they have been called out, you would agree, most of you would agree that it's the Indian Armed Forces. Whether it's an external aggression, internal security problems, or aid to civil authorities, as what's going on right now in Chennai, our soldiers have always been there. Troops in combat have a very, very tough situation at times. Just so you know that when we have to attack a post of a section held by a section of 10 men, the ratio of attackers to defenders is 1 is to 4, which means to attack a section, you have to launch an attack with a platoon of 40 people. In the mountains, this ratio changes from 1 is to 4 to 1 is to 10. Because if you have a section of 10 men holding a post, a company minus of 100 have to launch the attack because only then about 10 or 15 will reach on top. That's our attrition rate, 80 to 90 percent attrition. And unlike corporates, our attrition is permanent. Like most mistakes in the army, our mistakes come home in body bags. So when these 100 men are lined up and they're looking to the right and they're left, they know that out of the 100 here who begin the assault, only a handful will see the end of that day. Most of them would be dead, and many of them would be worse than dead, handicapped, amputees. And yet, they will write their last letters to their families, to their parents, to their unborn children at times. They will heft their battle packs, cock up their rifles, roar the war cry of their paltan, and they will launch that attack. A question I ask very often in B-schools is, why do our soldiers do this? And across B schools, from the young students, from the cream of our country, the future leaders, the answers that I get is because of patriotism, because of the national flag, because of the uniform. They do it for us. That's what they tell me. And that sounds very nice and warm and fuzzy inside. Until I put up the map of India and ask a very fair question. I ask them a question that if you believe your army is doing it for you, where are they doing it? I asked them, where is Kargil, where is Siachen, or where is any one of the hundreds of battlefields where our soldiers have fought? And now something really funny happens. Bright kids who can point out San Jose, San Francisco from the world map struggle to point out where is Siachen, where we have been fighting for the last three and a half decades. I'm sure you guys all know where Siachen is, right? It's only those kids who don't know. While in the past, our lack of knowledge of our own army would have been shameful and sad. Right now, it is suicidal. And let me tell you why. When I joined the army, I came from a fairly conventional background, a South Indian family, and we had this whole construct of juta, and you can't drink from someone else's uh, cup or eat some from someone else's plate. And it was more to do with, I think, tradition rather than caste or discrimination. But you had a sense that you were different from the others. So imagine my shock that when I joined the army, we were given this one enamel mug. And that mug was your coffee mug, it was your shaving mug, it was your bathing mug, and it was your, yeah, every other mug. You got it. And then got a little worse because it's a regulation issue. So despite scratching your name on it, they would get interchanged. And yeah, and so you could be drinking your coffee from someone else's every other mug. And that might sound weird to you. But for us, it was battle inoculation because before you knew it, someone else's blood could be coursing through your veins. When a soldier is wounded, he doesn't really care whether he's getting the blood from a Christian, Muslim, Sikh, Jat, Maratha, it doesn't really matter. And that way, the Indian Armed Forces is an amazing place. For example, the first Sikh unit, the first Sikh battalion is one of the oldest and the most decorated units of the Indian Armed Forces. This was the unit which was airlifted in October 1947 to stop the Pakistani Lashkars who were raiding Kashmir. And this was the unit which halted them at Srinagar. And it's thanks to this unit's gallant action that Kashmir is on the map of India. This unit of the finest Khalsa warriors is led by a Muslim commanding officer. And he leads them not only in battle, not only in exercises, he leads them in the Gurbani every day in the Gurdwara. Or take the case of Trija. In 1965 operations, they were tasked 
for one of the most difficult tasks which was the capture of a location called Dogre and that battle has gone down in the annals of Indian history as one of the most tough battles ever fought because it was street to street, room to room, hand to hand but Dogre was so pivotal for that operation that when their Anglo-Indian commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Desmond Hayes, spoke to his men and explained to them the importance of that particular objective, he told them that we have to be in Dogre by nightfall, dead or alive. And after giving them the briefing, he asked his Jat troops in his clipped Haryanvi, Susare, aaj raat ko teen Jat kaha hogi? And the troops shouted back, Dograi, Dograi. He wanted to make sure that the troops understood that the mission was larger than the leader. And then he asked them, Oh, Susare, agar Shio sahab ne goli laggi, to phir kya karoge? And without batting an eyelid, the senior Jesho shouted back, Saab ji, agar Shio ne goli laggi, to kande pe taan ke le jayenge, lekin rukenge Dograi jake. And that night, in that operation, three JAR, consisting of JAR troops under an Anglo-Indian commanding officer, took back Dogre not once but twice, winning three Mahavir Chakra, four Veer Chakras and seven Sena medals in one single operation. Our soldiers don't fight. They don't care about the name on their chests, which is their own name. They care about the name on their shoulder, which is their Paltan's name. Once they join the unit, if they join a Gurkha unit, they become a Gurkha. If they join a Maratha unit, they become a Maratha. They become a band of brothers. They really don't care about caste, creed, gotras, religions and all of that stuff. And I think, my sense is, it's not just the army that feels that way. Some of you may remember in 1992, in Parvanu, in the timber trail, there was this cable car which broke and it was dangling by a cable and there were many souls who were trapped inside it and they were going to plunge to certain death. There's a beautiful story of a Hindu woman who was trapped inside and she was praying to her gods to save her. And before a little while, they heard the thud of a chopper coming, the thud, thud, thud of a hepter coming in. And that hepter was being flown by squadron leader Pali Major who went on to become the air chief of the Indian Air Force. And from that hepter, the para commando, first para commando unit, a legendary para-commando, Captain Ivan Krasto, slithered down and entered into the cable car and saved the lives of the people inside. Now, here's something really funny. This woman was reaching out to her Hindu gods, but it was a Christian para-commando who came down, flown by a Parsi major, by a Parsi pilot. And we have seen this across the board when we are going for rescue into national, natural calamities or, or floods or even 26-11. Neither the hostages, neither the people who have been rescued, nor the people who are rescuing really care about the religion, the caste, the creed, the composition of the troops who are coming to save them. I don't know how many of you know this, that in our armed forces, we don't have any mandir, masjid, gurdwara. We have what is called a sarva dharm stal, in which all the religions are prayed together. And a Malvi will do a pandit's job, pandit will stand in for a granthi, Somehow the gods don't seem to care either. But when this soldier comes back home, he gets a different world. He gets a completely different world. There is leaders, his political leaders, his religious leaders, his, uh, his friends, his relatives tell him a different story. They tell him that that caste is stealing away jobs. This caste is taking away reservations. That person is different from you because he eats a different kind of meat. They tell him that you have to be our caste first and an Indian later. Ladies and gentlemen, soldiers don't fight with weapons. They fight on a moral high ground. Soldiers don't go into war because they hate the enemy in the front. They go to war because they love their countrymen in the back. <laughs> Leaders across spectrums have their own agendas. Some people want to win elections, some people want to get more power, and some people genuinely want to do good for their own communities. But we, as citizens, have to realize one thing, that even as I'm speaking to you right now, standing over here, from Kanyakumari to Kargil, there are soldiers who are deployed in every kind of situation. Right now, as I speak to you, there is a captain out there in Siachen Glacier 
who is already battling three fronts. He has got a front of a very determined enemy. He has got a front of a very horrible weather which claims lives almost on a daily basis. And he is battling the front of the nonsense going on in Delhi with Jantar Mantar, with veterans fighting the government, government fighting the veterans. I beg of you, let's not open a fourth front for him. Let's not forget that the strength of this country, which is symbolized by your armed forces, is the unity of its diversity. Let's not forget that. Jain! Jain! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.